What's going on guys and welcome back to another video. Now I wasn't going to release a video today, but after seeing the Peloton results, it's difficult not to make a video, right? So Peloton are down 32% in the pre-market, right? So look at that, they've absolutely fallen off a cliff. So in today's video, we're going to get into why, what has happened, and whether it's a buying opportunity or whether this is something that you should stay clear of. So when we look at the first news article here, right, we can see that Peloton Interactive EPS misses by 0.17 dollars, right, 17 cents, and misses on revenue. <clears throat> right, so it doesn't seem like that would warrant a 32% drop, right? That seems incredibly uh, significant, right? So misses earnings per share by just 17 cents. Now that's not a big deal because Peloton is not a profitable business at this point. It's very much a growth company, so there's no surprises there. And then when we look at revenue, revenue increased by 6%, which granted is not great, right? Not for a company that's supposed to be growing very fast and has the market multiples, which should, which suggests that it should be growing very fast, right? But they only missed revenue uh, estimates by $3.5 million. So clearly there's something else going on here. So let's get into the earnings report and see what exactly that is. Now, the first thing that I want to show you is effectively the number of subscriptions. How many people are actually paying for Peloton services, right? So we can see that Connected Fitness subscriptions have actually increased and they're continuing to increase. From So from there, it looks pretty good, right? Okay, the, the increase isn't significant, but compared with Q1 of the prior year, that's a huge increase, right? It's almost doubled. So that looks quite good. However, when you actually get into the detail of it, you start to realize that actually things aren't what they seem. So we can actually see that the number of workouts in Q3 of FY21 was 150 million, and that has dropped down to 120 million. So that's around a 20% decrease, which is not good. And that can be shown in the average monthly workouts as well, where we hit a peak of 26 workouts per month. And now we're down at 16.6. And the reason why I say that, that these, these two graphs here below are far more significant than these graphs at the top. And I'll tell you why, right? Here we can see a decline in the number of workouts. And although that the fitness subscriptions appear to be going up, what is going to happen when people stop using the services? What will happen is that they will slowly fade away and then eventually they will cancel their subscription, right? So effectively what I'm saying is that this graph here will always more or less follow this graph here but with a delay, right? So as we start to see the number of workouts drop off, we will then start to see people canceling their subscriptions as they're no longer using the product. And therefore, as a result of that, we'll see the number of subscriptions fall as well, which of course is going to mean that the number of revenue, the total quarterly revenue is going to fall as well. And we actually see that in management's guidance, which we'll get onto shortly. But first I want to show you the breakdown of the income statement. So we can see here that revenue has increased by 6%, as we noted earlier on. But when we look at the connected fitness products, which is pr primarily the bikes, right? So the equipment that people use. So there's the bikes and then there's the treadmill. They're the two primary products, right? But the, side, the bikes are by far the, the largest product. $501 million of revenue compared with $601 million of revenue the year before. So straight away, that goes to show us that less people are purchasing the product. Now, there is one thing to bear in mind here, right? And that is that in August, Peloton made the decision to reduce the price of their bike from, I believe, $2,000 or around there to around $1,500. So clearly, we can see the impact of that. So it might not be the case that less people are buying their products, but actually they're selling their products at a lower price. But either way, it's not a good sign that a company is having to reduce the price of something by 20, 25%. So when we look at the cost of sales of those bikes, right, we can see that in uh, 2020, it was $364 million. And in 2021, despite the fact that they've made less revenue, their costs have actually increased to $441 million. So what does that show us? It shows us margin contraction, which again is not very good. So they're making around a 12% margin, and that's gross margin, not net margin. Making around a 12% gross margin on selling their products, their physical products. So that is definitely not good, and that is a significant decrease on the year prior. When we go to subscription revenue, however, which is actually the better part of their business, it is, it's more scalable, it has uh, greater margins. Things are actually looking pretty good from this side. So we can see here that in 2020, revenue was $156 million. 
And we fast forward to 2021 and it's almost doubled to $304 million. So that is solid growth. And when we look at the cost of sales size, it's similar sort of margins across both. And actually the margins of the subscription business, as I mentioned just a moment ago, is far better than that of the physical products. So we can see here that their gross margins are around 68%, something like that off the top of my head, <laughs> um, compared with, as I said, 12% gross margins for the connected uh, fitness products. So clearly the subscription business is where it's at and that's what they should be focusing on. However, the vast majority of people are going to need the bike to actually be subscribed, right? That's not entirely true because I know that they do have, um, they, some people do have subscriptions without having the bikes, but ultimately if you want the full experience, you need the bikes as well, or the treadmills, whatever it may be. Anyway, when we move on to their operating expenses, we can see that sales and marketing expenses have more than doubled, which is absolutely insane when you consider that their revenues have only increased by 6%. So effectively, they are pumping a load of money into marketing. They're saying to everybody, look how great our product is, come and buy our product and they have doubled their spend on that, and their return in terms of revenue, so not profits, their return in terms of revenues on that is 6%. So that is absolutely abysmal. And it goes to show me that less and less people are interested in their products. That is not a good sign. When we move across to general and administrative costs, again, that has almost doubled, right? Well, no, sorry, it has more than doubled. Uh, to $240 million. Again, that is not a good sign. And when I read into the report in detail, they said that that was in part due to professional fees. Uh, now, they didn't say exactly what they were, but I would imagine that it may be to do with litigation, so legal cases in sort of defending themselves around um, effectively the, the recall of the treadmills. So we are all aware of that incident when the stock fell by something like 15% down to around $85. Um, which at this point looks like a very high price considering we're now sitting at below $60. Um, but yeah, we're all aware of that issue. So clearly that has had an impact on their expenses. Research and development costs have almost tripled as well. So that's gone from just under 37 million to almost $98 million. And that's not so bad because research and development shows a investment in the company that they're trying to innovate new products, come up with new ideas in which ultimately should drive revenue. So the fact that they're putting a lot of money into research and development is actually a good sign. However, when we look at the total operating expenses, we can see for the year that was $622 million compared with $260 million the year before. So again, more than double in the amount of operating expenses. When we compare that with gross profit, so gross profit has actually decreased right, by around $60 million or $70 million, and yet operating expenses have nearly doubled and they've increased by $360 million, whatever that looks like there. So a significant increase on their operating expenses compared with a decrease in their gross profit. So needless to say, in the year prior, they made a profit of $70 million, and now they've made a loss of $360 million. So from their income statement, absolutely horrible results, but that is not the sole driver of the fall. Now, the one thing to remember here, right, is that this is a stock that was valued for the 30% decline at $26 billion, right? And we look at how much they made in a good quarter, that was $70 million. So clearly this is trading at very high multiples. And when a stock is trading at high multiples, you want to see continued growth, continued margin improvements, and continued prospects for the business. And that's just not what we're seeing with Peloton. So when we move on to their balance sheet, on the face of it, it looks pretty decent, right? But I'll tell you why that is not the case in just a moment. However, we can see we've got $600 million of cash and $300 million of marketable securities. So we've got around $900 million in total liquid assets, right? We've also got inventories of $1.3 billion, which has actually increased compared with the quarter prior. Now, the issue I have with this is that a lot of people might have said that because of supply chain issues, we can't get the product. And that's why our revenues aren't as good as they could have been because we aren't able to get the products in. Clearly, Peloton can't make that excuse, right? They're sitting on $1.3 billion worth of inventory that they simply cannot shift. So that isn't a good sign. And anyway, moving on to cash, we can see that their cash precision has fallen. So we're at $900 million here compared with around $1.5, $1.6 billion uh, just a quarter ago. So clearly that is not very good either. 
Um, however, they don't have any significant amount of debt, right? They've got some lease liabilities, but other than that, they don't have any actual debt. So from that point of view, not too bad. However, what we need to do is we need to go down to the cash flow and see how much cash they're actually burning through. And that's where we go to cash from operations, right? So net cash used in or provided by operating activities. So where we see the brackets here, if net cash is used in, that means it's a negative. Effectively, we're not generating cash in our operating activities. We're burning through cash, right? So negative $561 million, right? $561 million in one quarter is the amount of cash that we've just burned through. Now, when we consider we've got around $900 million of cash on the balance sheet, it's not going to be very long. It's not going to be very many quarters before we've burnt through all of our cash, right? And what does that give us? That gives us less than two quarters of runway. So what does that mean? We're going to have to issue shares or and, and therefore dilute shareholders, or they're going to have to raise debt and therefore effectively harm the profitability of the business because they're going to be paying interest on that debt, right? So either way, without a doubt, right, I'm not saying that this business is going to go bankrupt or anything like that, but for sure, they are going to have to raise debt or uh, issue new shares and either one of those things is not going to be good for the shareholder so again not a good sign but it's not just the fact that it was a bad quarter which is why we've seen a 31 or 32 percent decline in their share price in the after hours right the key reason or one of the key reasons is the fact that they have updated their full year fy22 guidance and we can see that they're actually now forecasting for between 4.4 and 4.8 billion dollars in total revenue now, what was we expecting before? If we flick across to the consensus estimates, we're expecting $5.3.5 billion. So let's call that $5.4 billion. In effect, they've reduced their estimated forecast or revenue by $1 billion or around 20%. So that is a huge decline. And that would mean that the business is growing at around 10% on the 2021 numbers. Now, 10% growth for a company that's trading at around, I think it's around a six times sales multiple. So if I just look here, enterprise value to revenue, it's around six and a half. But that is, to be fair, at the $86 mark, right? That is going to fall significantly, of course, once we take into account that 30% drop. Either way, if I'm buying a company that has relatively low margins, I mean, in this case, it's actually loss making. But you could maybe see a route to profitability if they can scale that subscription service. However, if I'm paying sort of four, five times revenue for a business, I want that business to be growing a lot faster than just 10%, regardless of, of the, a path to profitability for this business. But evidently, profitability is not within this business's reach within the next few years, right? Because we can see here that they are adjusting in FY22 for a loss of between 425 and 475 million dollars on an adjusted EBITDA basis. So that is not very good at all. But just flicking back to the chart momentarily, we can see just how significant that drop off is. We can see that that's a 32% decline and we're now sitting at around $59. And I say that because I want to look across to the charts from a technical perspective. Now I've got this on a daily chart and we're going back all the way to March 2020. Clearly from March 2020, it's been on a significant run due to the pandemic and that makes a lot of sense. However, we can see that effectively between these two blue lines here is where it's been consolidating ever since sort of September 2020, right? And it's always been within these two ranges and it seems to bounce off around $83. And that was a sort of a key line of support for this stock. However, below $83, I struggle to find another line of support, right? And it looks like the next line of support maybe all the way down to around $42. So I would be very concerned about this stock falling all the way down to around $42 because it just doesn't look like there's another level of support. It might not be the case. We might get some buyers coming in who are bullish on the company long term. Um, but for me, this is just a stock where I would be very, very concerned if I was holding it. Not because of the technical chart. The technical chart just supports my thesis that this is a business where it benefited largely from the pandemic. And actually, when people were thinking that this might be the future, I think that that's just not the case. I think that people actually like to get out of their house, go to the gym and do a proper workout that way. Clearly, there's always going to be some level of demand for these products. But when a business is trading at four and a half or five times sales, 
and only growing at potentially 10% revenue per year and unprofitable and is going to need to raise cash. It's just not looking very good for this business. Anyway, that is all for today's video, guys. I hope you've enjoyed the video and until next time, thank you.